Hello and welcome to this uh, special show. We seem to be at an inflection point when it comes to technology. The speed at which things are changing, whether it's artificial intelligence or uh, biotech or other forms of technology, we seem to be at a tipping point. You've been hearing a lot about AI and that is certainly reached a tipping point of some sort. I guess we're lucky in India to some extent that we've got a government and we've got ministers like Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar, who's now joining us, who understand technology quite deeply, who really have their finger on the pulse and who have a fairly great sense on what's happening. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Vikram. Your Minister of State for Electronics, Information Technology, Skill Development, Entrepreneurship, a whole range of areas. As you look at what's happening right now, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence, are you also getting the sense that we are at a tipping point? Oh, yeah, 100%. I think uh, there's absolutely uh, no doubt, uh, there's incontrovertible evidence that uh, generally the world of technology, and in particular these areas like artificial intelligence, we have reached a point where they have been, they, we have in a sense transformed from where they were discourses on the, they were discourses that were outliers to normal conversations to being completely centered around everything that we say and think and do about the future. And certainly one of the areas that is uh, galloping leaps and bounds uh, and accelerating at a very, very rapid pace is AI and learning in, in particular and, uh, and, and, the fo and the role and the influence of AI on the internet, on the tech space as we know it or as we knew it. What's happened in AI, and the AI has been spoken about for decades, let's yeah. face it. It's always been that big change which was coming. And suddenly, when it's happening now in the last two, three months, it's feeling as if you've crossed that, that tipping point, as you were saying. I'm sure you've played around with GPT, chat GPT first yeah. and now GPT-4. Um, it is feeling as if this is something that could really change everything. Jobs are going to be changing dramatically. Somebody who is not AI-enabled, competing with somebody who is you know, AI-enabled is not going to be a fair competition. Um, as, as a minister and as a government, when you look at this, are you saying we have to change everything that we are doing to keep this in mind? If you look at the history of technology, what we've seen in semiconductor and electronics, then we've seen in the internet, and now we are seeing in the AI, which is that an idea takes shape, gets formed in some labs and some garages around the world, and suddenly there's a coming together of all of the ingredients required to create critical mass. We saw that in the semiconductor space and the chip was, uh, the book talks about it. We saw that exactly in the internet. It is same for the AI, which is that as more and more GPUs and AI compute capacity became available. And on the other hand, more and more data sets and learning and data as a consequence of digitization of the world has become available. We suddenly have these large language models and these really, really powerful models that are emerging. So I think as is the case with every single big historical development in the area of tech, an idea takes root, pieces of it come together, and there is a certain point in the history of that particular area where it just becomes a force. I think one of the areas where this could be different is because as it's improving, exponentially improving, <coughs> recursively learning and improving further, the possibility for both the good and the bad can be outsized. No, Vikram, when, I, when it comes to good, you could have the solving of climate change. When it comes to the bad... But, but it's, the same, have... it's the same, same, really same thing that we've seen with the internet. It was always a utopia. It was always designed to be a powerful enabler of good things on, uh, 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 that came out of technology. But we've seen in the last 10 years with big tech, with user harm, that as governments around the world fail to keep up with the regulation of harm, the internet, which was originally a power for good, has also become now uh, a place where evil and criminality and user harm resides. It is the same for tech, but you can see certainly that if you don't develop guardrails, we don't develop ethical and risk-free use of AI, just like we did not do in the internet, there is a great significant possibility of harm. And in this case, if it can, last week I had the privilege of talking to Nick Bostrom, yeah, who yeah. first wrote super intelligence and yes. you know, existential risk to mankind. In this case, if we don't regulate it, and the scary part is one country can't do it, one company can't Absolutely. do it, all of mankind has to. If you don't regulate it, you don't control it, 
it could actually become an extinction extinction level Look, risk. I, I I tend not to get swayed by uh, or panicked by these doomsday scenarios of suddenly a computer becoming a human and uh, and the robot super intelligence. yeah super intelligence and all of that. I think uh, I am of the view that human intelligence certainly, as uh, the history of the world has shown, will certainly keep pace with or track ahead of any machine intelligence. I mean, I, I believe that. And certainly, I think if we wake up to the risks of a particular technology, for us to regulate it and create guardrails and go-no-go areas is not a difficult task. But uh, clearly, as you said, it has to be recognized by the world, governments of the world, peoples of the world, that yes, this can do good, but yes, we must also mitigate the harm that it does. India is the chair this year of the GPE, the Global uh, Program for Artificial Intelligence. It is a coming, it is a grouping of all the nations in the world that do work in AI. And one of the key agenda items for GPE under India's chairmanship is about ethical and risk-free use of AI. What does that mean? What are the do's and don'ts of that? What is the policy action? What are the global protocols necessary to make sure one jurisdiction does not become a hub for non-ethical use of AI while the rest of the world is trying to protect itself from uh, from the consequences of use of AI. And we saw with COVID, one country which goes which gets it wrong can suddenly Absolutely. spread it to, to, to and, and with the very nature of the internet, Vikram, there is no way, there are no borders, there are no ways of blocking content that comes out unless you are a China, which we are not. Most liberal democracies and open countries are not. So therefore, it's absolutely important for a global understanding of what the risks and user harm out of AI are. And I don't mean to panic anybody and say, look, look, we should not embrace technology because there's harm in it. But I, I certainly think the advances in tech, advances in AI should be parallelly with a discourse and a discussion on what are the guardrails that we need to put in place. I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent way of putting it. The other question, of course, coming from an India point of view. Um, I have also had the chance to speak to Pedro, Pedro Dominguez, mm -hmm. who wrote the master algorithm. Of course. He said it's a, it seems to be a race between the USA and China right now, but countries like India have a chance. And I'm sure you feel that we have more than a chance and that as India, we should be one of the pioneers and the leaders in AI and really, really have a... A lot of the engineers are there. The two companies doing the most in it, both of them are Indian origins. So. Yeah, no, no, look, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind. And I'm, I'm not saying this because I want to be bombastic or nor is this political rhetoric. That India will be a significant pole in the universe of AI going forward. I understand, we are at very early days of AI. Chat GPT is not, is AI. But it's certainly not all things AI. And uh, uh, it is an indicator, in my opinion, chat GPT is a marker in the ground about that indicates to the rest of the world that this is the power, potential power of AI, if harnessed right. We are today, with our India AI policy, assembling what is going to be one of the world's highest quality and most diverse data sets program in the world. You know bias is a very, very important problem to be addressed in AI. And chat GPT proves that occasionally. One of the things that we are doing is to position our data sets program as one of the most bias free uh, data sets in the world, most diverse. So I have absolutely no doubt in my mind <coughs> for all the medals being handed out to India, uh, the US and China, uh, I think we are at the beginning of the race today. We are certainly at the starting line. And I don't want to say we will lead the world or we don't want to be, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to make these bombastic statements, but certainly we'll be in the leading pack in terms of shaping the future of AI, applications, use cases of AI uh, that will benefit citizens. Well, in your, in your case, of course, you're also the Minister of Skill Development. So the crucial parts of that are how will AI be, for example, how do you get, give people the skills in AI? How do you educate people and how do you use AI effectively? And it's not just to do my homework, I got ChatGPT yeah, yeah. to do my homework, which is one of the ways of doing it. Yeah. We have to be able to skill people effectively. This is the new powerful technology. Here's how you use it to move up the value chain sure. and get jobs. Yeah, no, absolutely right. I'm, and I think AI is about doing, uh, as we see AI, 
AI is about doing what we do today, but doing it much with greater efficacy, doing it with a greater deal of, uh, deal of focus, smartness and intelligence, whether that is governance, whether that is healthcare, whether that is education. So we see our deployment, the Prime Minister has made it very clear in, way back in 2018, that India's AI will be developed in India, but it will be also built around the Indian use case. We are not <coughs> so concerned about whether the search engine uh, that Google uses or Bing uses or anybody else uses is powered by uh, AI or ChatGPT. But we are certainly are focused on the fact that a billion Indians in the remotest part of India, when we design schemes for them, when we design programs for them, when we measure the efficacy that we use AI, we use learning, we use the data sets and create in my opinion, as the largest democracy, data-led governance, AI-led governance as the biggest use case in AI. AI-led healthcare as the biggest use case for AI. So we are quite happy with people uh, innovating around the edges and on the fringes on search engines and other applications. But we are about, the India AI program is predominantly about harnessing the power of learning. So one of the important aspects of that is that the, the, the entire India stack, I mean, let's, let's face it. Absolutely. The reason why the rest of the world looks at India and says there's something really interesting happening out there is the India stack, public digital goods on top of which private sector can sure. innovate. It's UPI, it's ONDP, it's in e-commerce, yeah. it's FDigilocker, all of that, right. that, that thing. The potential to take that forward and to power it with AI and to use all of that data yep. into other things is that where you think the real opportunity is? 100%. You hit the nail on the head. I've announced this a uh, few months ago when we had the India Stack Developers Conference that as a startup today in India, you look at the India Stack and say, yes, this is a stack up of various applications, but I'm alerting you to the fact that all of these applications are going to have the next version, which are going to have AI embedded into it. So imagine... Today, at the very basic level, we have an Aadhaar identity authentication platform powered by AI. Then you have the UPI, the financial platform, intermediation platform powered by AI that can learn through these millions and billions of transactions and do a much better job on either routing a transaction or identifying a person or whatever. So the India stack, the next version of it is going to be very, very significantly powered by AI, and that goes to what I said, the biggest use case that India AI will seek to develop applications for is on governance, democracy 2.0, and that type of application that impacts the lives of Indian people. So obviously the concern with that will then be things like privacy, like security, like cyber crime, all of that becomes important. Absolutely right. That digital India, uh, you know, the Digital mm. India Act that you said is coming soon. Uh, is this the, the biggest things that you're going to be confronting? Absolutely right. It could go wrong also. I mean, for all the good that can happen, it can go wrong if it's not done. Look, correctly. look, like in, the, in the technology world, I think it's a safe bet that the odds of it going wrong are equal to the odds of it get, going right. I mean, that is just the nature of the beast. That is technology. But if some things go wrong, the ability to respond fast, evolve, uh, mitigate that wrong with a set of rules, with a set of laws, is what a governments of the world have to do in the future. Uh, there will be mistakes. There will be things that go wrong. There will be disruptions that will come out from nowhere that will change and upend all your assumptions about the way you are going forward in a particular area. So all of those things are normal. But the ability of our framework, the way we are building it, with the Digital India Act, with the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill, with the cybersecurity strategy, is that if these things are, in a some sense, disrupted, which will be the new normal, the government and the law will have the ability to respond very quickly. So one of the concerns that many people have expressed about sure. all the legislations is too much government control, what happens to privacy, are we building a surveillance state, you know, Big Brother I mean, is watching I, look, us. Look, uh, you know, we, have, uh, we are a healthy democracy and the right to being paranoid and the right to being wrong is as much a fundamental right. The right to speculate is also a fundamental right, I suppose. Uh, but we have done every bit of this stuff and we will continue to do every bit of this legislative work through consultations. So it's not like I sit in a room uh, with somebody, some bureaucrat and say, this is what the law will be and that will be the law. 
the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi ji, has said, for every step we take in the digital ecosystem, it should be seen as being designed and architected by the principal stakeholders of that particular move. So whether it's the Digital India Act, whether it's the DPDP, the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill, or indeed the design of India AI. For India AI, we had a meeting with over 400 uh, AI practitioners, stakeholders, thinkers in a room. And I said, we will together design India AI. What will be the outcomes of India AI? What ought to be the design feature? What will be the institutional capacity? All right, when you look at some technologies, though, you seem to feel, uh, the government certainly seems to feel that these are more dangerous technologies and we don't want to encourage them too much. I'm okay. speaking specifically of crypto, for example, mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, which is probably a right call, by the way. I'm not a great yeah. fan of crypto. But when you're regulating or controlling crypto, that has its own implications on blockchain and how that can be enabled. So crypto, how do you... Crypto how... is not a regulation of technology at all. We have said very clearly that on Web3 and blockchain, and, and particularly, and all things blockchain, we are completely invested in India leading the charge into Web3. Hmm. Crypto is an issue to do with macroeconomics and it's about financial regulation. The RBI has a problem with something that is floating around in a tokenized form that is uh, not accountable to any, anything or anybody. And you've seen with the meltdown of FTX and you've seen all of this, that at the end of the day, most of these cryptos are technology innovations, they pretend to be innovations, but essentially in a lot of ways are totally undermanaged Ponzi schemes or mismanaged Ponzi schemes. I couldn't agree. So certainly for the Reserve Bank of India and the government of India, in the name of innovation, in the name of advances in technology, we can't have people of India or the citizens of India being gamed uh, and losing money. So we have stepped in and said, crypto, if an Indian citizen wants to invest in crypto, he has to go through FEMA. He has to go and be available. He has to buy the dollars that he uses to buy the crypto through the liberal LRS scheme of the RBI. Certainly, if somebody thinks that he can exchange his rupees for cryptos, he's violating about half a dozen laws, including, uh, but not limited to FEMA. Right. Let me just turn to hardware. I mean, we can, we can keep discussing all yeah, the yeah. other technologies, but really, Perhaps the most exciting story in the last year or two years has been what's been happening with hardware, electronic manufacturing, Absolutely. India becoming an exporter in mobile phones, semiconductor, yes. realistic expectations that India may finally, finally become a player mm -hmm. in semiconductors. What is the latest you can tell us on these fronts? Look, on the electronics front, I have absolutely, uh, I agree with you that we are living in very exciting times. Um, in 2014, we had about one lakh or, or of some electronics production in this country. In, by 26, 25, 26, we will be doing 24 lakh crores, 24 times jump in a decade. Uh, in 2014, almost 82% of mobile phones consumed in India were imported. And in 2022, 100% of the mobile phones are assembled and made in India. In 2014, we were exporting zero. And in 2022, we are exporting about 85, 90,000 crores of mobile phones, Apple and Samsung. And next year, we expect mobile phone exports to be in the top 10 exports of India and crossing 1 lakh crores. So in electronics manufacturing, we have gone from being a nobody in 2014 and a totally devastated electronics ecosystem to being today a country which has reasonable ambitions of being a significant player in the changing electronic GVCs post-COVID. Uh, we have a target of 300 billion, as I said, 24 lakh crores by 25, 26. And I think we are well on track. Of that 300 billion, I expect about 120 billion to be exports, which is not insignificant, which is 10 lakh crores from the current number of 1 lakh crore. So Further 10x jump in exports. Yeah, absolutely right. So I think it is a, it is a, it is a, it is, it's a really coming of age of India in the electronics GVCs. And in a lot of ways, the Prime Minister was prescient and his, his instinct in 2014 is playing out now in uh, post-COVID uh, shifting of the GVCs. And, and, and the, 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 the landscape is also correct with, with, with skepticism about China, with concerns about Taiwan, correct. with the possibility of war between China and Taiwan, right. all of those concerns, China plus one becomes a strategy. And therefore, for the first time, there's actually a, a realistic chance that semiconductors could also move out here. Yeah, and on the semiconductor front, I can tell you that in December 2021, we started this journey. 
uh, and we are very confident and I can without revealing too much that is detailed till the cabinet approves it that we will certainly be um, having a 28 nanometer 40 nanometer fab in India very soon 28 40 nanometer fab in fab, India yeah, very soon. with a with proven global standard technology uh, that will come from a leading technology major so I can tell you that uh, in the design side of semiconductors by the end of this year we will have at least 50 startups uh, directly or indirectly assisted by the government that are all de designing devices or for different applications and in the talent side the in, we will have almost 85,000 semiconductor skilled professionals in a scheme that is where the academic system is implementing it in 2023 that's this year by 2026 so postdoctoral doctoral masters bachelors the curriculum has been completely redesigned by industry and that process is undergoing implementation today so we will have talent fab design and at, at the heart of it we will also have in semiconductor research uh, an india semiconductor research center that will be uh, industry enabled industry partnered which will do cutting edge research in semiconductor as well so india as a semiconductor nation which was a dream of the prime minister in 21 december i think we are taking steady steps and recently signed agreement between india and us in critical technologies gives a further boost to that right last question and i, I, I know we are, we are running out of time uh, startups entrepreneurship another area where you've done you had a very good meeting it gave people confidence to say don't worry about what's happening with svb yeah, yeah don't keep your money abroad get it back into sure. banks into india move it in, in, in give cities are you concerned about the fallout of SVB? Are you concerned about a funding winter which might come here, no. given all the shakiness that's happening no, no, around SVB, the world? SVB, the problem was not about funding at all. SVB was a problem of operationalizing your working capital, your day-to-day -day operation of your deposits, payroll, accounting, and so on and so forth. And I can't blame these young startups. I mean, even I, some years ago, would have been overawed by the Silicon Valley Bank brand name. Uh, everybody thinks that the American banking system is the most best regulated and the strongest banking system in the world. So I think they made that assumption and they went ahead and did that. What I have told them is, look, the Indian banking system today in 2023 is certainly the most prudent and the strongest banking system in the world. I've explained to startups that start using the Indian banking system. And I've also written a, a small note to the finance minister where the Indian banking system can be more proactive in terms of dealing with and acquiring startups business and dealing with startups requirements. All right. Chand Shekhar, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Let's hope all those plans roll out. These are exciting times in technology. Thank you. And exciting times for digital India absolutely. and technological right. India, all of that. So the, the India tech aid as the Prime Minister refers to it. Absolutely. So we'll keep on coming back to you and finding how it's going. Thank, thank you, you so much thank for you. joining us. Thank you. Thank you.